I welcome you all and thank you all for coming. So the first thing that I would like to ask all of you is I'd like for each of you to give um, an introduction on your thoughts on this general subject, but even more so, there are some very passionate people in the audience who care about this. But there's also a lot of people who are watching our conference and are saying, oh, this is a great time to take a break. Joel Furman's not speaking, and they're not talking about paleo versus plant-based, they're talking about EMFs and something called 5G. This doesn't really sound like something that's a serious health issue or an important issue. Um, yeah, maybe this is a good time to, to take a break from the real truth. We'll come back when they start talking about food again. But this stuff about invisible things that we can't even see, it just doesn't, I don't, it just doesn't sound very serious. And I've never seen anyone you know, fall down and die from it. So maybe you could open up of why, um, why you guys are all so concerned about this, um, why you um, are speaking about this, writing books about this, and feeling like this is such an urgent topic. If you could give us some opening thoughts on what's on your mind um, and help us to tell the public why this is something that should be on their radar too. What do you recommend? Hello, that, hello, hello, here? hello. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. I just want to say I feel very grateful and privileged to be here um, in an audience of people who are concerned about health. And so thank you. Um, let me just, for let your me just interrupt and say this is Katie Singer, and that's Theodora Scarato. So Katie is saying, okay. speaking now. Hi. Um, Pardon? Okay. So, um, I'll say that for probably 20 years, I have not known what health is. So if the environment around us is toxic and radiated, then I don't know what health is, and I'm just talking for myself personally. So I just pose that question to all of us to say, what is health? What is health for me and what is health for the society? And to be open to the answer, I don't know, because then we can have constructive conversation. Um, this is the Hippocrates Institute, and so we all know the Hippocratic Oath, which actually was not written by Hippocrates, but if the statement is first, do no harm, and we live in a world where much harm has been done and is continuing to be done, then again, how do we proceed? I do not have any real answers to this as much as I live with questions about these kinds of things. And I'm just very glad to be among people who are also open to these questions. In answer to Steve's questions about you know, why, why am I concerned and what is the frame that I live by? I go back billions of years ago when this planet was a mass of gases, water, rock, and dust. And then the sun heated the water and we had a buildup of charge and lightning began to strike. Actually, there was a bombardment of lightning that went on for millions of years. And out of that, we got nucleic and amino acids, and plants began to grow. <laughs> and um, and that, that provided oxygen so that animals, including humans, could show up. Humans are really new to this whole process, of course. Um, Mostly what I read is that humans have been here for about 200,000 years. Okay, then I'm going to take us back 250 years ago, which is really modern history. And that's when we humans developed the ability to generate, store, and transmit electrical energy. Then we got the electromagnet, 
I believe in 1844, and we could start making motors and machines. Um, radio and t I think we had radio and TV around 1904, am I right? And people were so excited, especially with the electronic appliances that people could put into their homes. So we got blenders and vacuum cleaners and washing machines and refrigerators and, and TVs and radios, and life changed drastically. In 1934, Congress passed the Broadcasting Act, and that established the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. And basically, the idea was, go forth and invent whatever you've got, and let's get this economy going, and let's get, you know, let's just free up everyone's imagination to build the kind of electronics that we can't even dream of right now in 1934. And so, with the establishment of the FCC, there was a definition from the FCC, which has never, I should say, been staffed by anyone other than engineers who really want to build electronic devices. And the, FC and the FCC defined harmful interference. Harmful interference is anything that interferes with existing radio or TV broadcasts. Now that definition includes internet and cellular services. So in other words, if you're running a radio and um, a light at the same time with a dimmer switch and you get interference, that's harmful interference. One machine to another. Harmful interference at the FCC has never included biological harm. So that was 1934 that we passed that. How do we live almost 100 years later in a world where biological harm is not recognized? Okay, um, I, let me just give you a couple other things. For me, it's very important to have basic vocabulary about the reality that we're in. Congress updated the Broadcasting Act in 1996. Section 704 states that no health or environmental concern can interfere with the placement of a cellular antenna. Can I say that again? You want me to say it again? Section 704 states that no health or environmental concern can interfere with the placement of a cellular antenna. That means if I am AT&T or Verizon and I want to put a cell tower out, you know, on your neighbor's property because I've signed a contract with your neighbor, um, it could be right next to a school, it could be on a school, and I go to your town council and I say, give me a permit, I'm AT&T. If your town says, we are concerned about the health issues here, that is, um, you can't do that. <laughs> the town cannot do that since 1996. So the only reasons that you're able to protest an antenna um, that is installed on private property or public pro property that's leased, the only reason is because you don't like the look of the thing. That's basically the reason. You don't like the aesthetics. Um, I think Theodora is going to talk a little about specific absorption rates that were determined in the mid-90s. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll get to that, but if, even if you don't. But um, um, trying to remember what else I was wanting. Um, OK, another thing at the FCC. It only recognizes thermal effects. And I should say immediate thermal effects. So 
they gave <clears throat> um, a plastic dummy that weighs 220 pounds, filled his head with salty, sugary fluid, and they took this plastic dummy's temperature. And then they gave the dummy a cell phone for six minutes. And then they took the dummy's temperature again. And because the temperature had not changed by two degrees Celsius in those six minutes, you can buy a cell phone. The test was looking at immediate thermal effects. We have thousands of studies showing non-thermal effects. That would include breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. That would include the um, cancer and DNA damage that the um, NTP study that Theodora talked about reports on. Um, that would include how uh, wildlife are impacted, um, how behavior is impacted when a pregnant woman uses a cell phone, and how her offspring are impacted, say, five or six years later, if the, the mother uses a cell phone during pregnancy. Those are non-thermal effects, and the FCC does not recognize them. Um, we are now facing 5G, and later I will tell you what's happening in Congress um, in the last two weeks with this new Congress, and there is one little ray of hopefulness um, from Congresswoman Eshoo in California, um, but we want to tell you about what's going on there. Um, the, oh, another thing that I wanted to say. Every cell in our bodies functions by electrochemical signals. So in other words, my brain remembering that I want to tell you something, that's an electrochemical signal. Digesting food is an electrochemical function. Everything we do, my hands moving right now, is an electrochemical signal. I take my cues, as all living creatures do, from the, the Earth's natural electrochemical environment, the, the natural electromagnetic fields in the environment. Um, and so, what, but what we've done in the last hundred years is drastically change that environment. And so now we come to this question, what is health now and what is possible? And you know, where, where does anyone have control? So those are some of the questions I'm asking. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Katie. Um, so I, I think it's sometimes people are wondering, well, how, are, uh, how does technology apply to health? And you, you really framed out and gave us a history of the story of electricity in our lives or in the world. Um, I think it's really hard for people to understand that you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't feel it, and how is it affecting us? I know for me, when I first learned about this issue, I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. But now that I understand it, um, one of the things that I think is really important to communicate is how we're getting exposures, not only from the devices that we use, but that other people use. Kind of like first-hand and second-hand smoke. And just like tobacco where first the company said, oh, there's, you know, it's not addictive and there's no problem, even though there were studies showing that it caused tumors early, early on. And then, well, okay, smoking is a problem, but not secondhand smoke. Now we know that secondhand smoke has effects, especially for children. And I heard there's a law in, uh, where they're talking about smoking in cars with kids um, and 
And now when we go places, you can't smoke inside of buildings because we know that even low levels of smoke um, can cause health effects. So likewise, when a lot of people use devices in a room and you're sitting next to someone, you're receiving some of that energy into your body, into your cells, and also someone who maybe is a little bit further away will also get some of that signal because it's traveling to the cell tower. Um, and if you're living near a cell tower and or a quote unquote small cell and you haven't even, you're not even using any devices, you're getting everyone else's, all those machines that are on that are connecting to the cell tower are, are going through you. Actually, some of that is being absorbed into your body. Yes, it's, it's much less than if a phone is to your ear. But your cells feel it. And there's published studies, we have it on our, our website, I know you've talked about it in your book, that um, have found a myriad of symptoms reported by people. And also there was a, a study that was just performed out of India, where they looked at people uh, close to cell antenna installations and then further away. They also did measurements in the bedroom and uh, found changes to their blood. Um, so I'm so glad that everyone's here and so interested in this really important issue that affects our health. I think it appropriate uh, that I address an exciting bit of information I received today before I speak about the subject, this incredibly important subject that, as Stephen pointed out, most people don't take nearly serious. Today, a colleague and a friend who happens to be in this room called me up early this morning and said, do you realize what happened in this wonderful country in Europe called Lithuania? And I said, no. They said they've constructed legislation, listen closely, that will be voted upon affirmatively in March that the standard of care, medicine in that country will be lifestyle medicine. So the country of Lithuania is gonna to go to lifestyle plant-based medicine. So all the people listening here and around the world, let's give them a lot of... So this will be a mature step in the right direction for all of humanity and a model that maybe countries like America who talk about our freedom will eventually give it to you. So to answer Stephen's question, uh, on the front lines, since I was a young guy in my 20s, working with some of the sickest people in the world, more than three decades ago, people would arrive, and I thought they were mentally ill. Let's be candid with you. They were saying when they went near a television, they felt nervous. So I said, well, that must be psychosis. And Slowly but surely, the so-called electronic age crept up on us. And I started to see more and more of these people to such a point I could no longer write it off. I could no longer say that this ever-growing, burgeoning group of people who had different personalities from all over the world all had a mental illness. So I was forced, by default, not intelligence, to look into this. And around the same time, my depth of knowledge in quantum physics became much greater. And you had an illustrious way to introduce this, and you said it too. You gave us the history of how we've adopted electric into our lives. And I said, wow, maybe these devices that we're sticking on our head and putting on our lap, called laptop computers, on our genitalia, and the towers, as from the great documentary I saw, 
outside of your apartment in New York, when you're close to that, causes more cancer. Not maybe, not possibly, but definitely. Then I met really odd people in my life, professors that were talking about electromagnetic pollution. And they taught me a term that has come to fruition, sadly, called universal conductors. People who are hypersensitive to this. And I thought, well, they're an enigma. We're all sensitive to this. They're just hypersensitive to this. They feel it. They are the canary in the cold mine. And there's more of those canaries. They have a flock of these canaries now. And so as I studied it, and as I watched it, and as I worked more and more with these people and got empathy, sympathy, and a little bit of knowledge to learn how to help them, to ground them, I recognized that this is a new disease. It's in the third category. Uh, as we sit here and speak in the real truth about health, we're holding a major medical conference. One of my friends and colleagues from Europe is there now, Dr. Rao, from Peristaltic Clinic. And he, like us, understand lifestyle consequence. And he, he surprised us the other day because he told us something we didn't even know. So said, when we talk about the big bad diseases, we talk about cancer, we talk about cardiovascular disease, he said, you know, there's a number three indecisive category of things doctors don't know what they are, they don't know how to treat them, so they either call them autoimmune diseases, and he said, let's call this category three that, by the way, supersedes heart disease and cancer. And that category three, what we're speaking about tonight, is clearly one of the factors implicated in why people are sick today. No question. So my wife, who's Swedish, got a hold of the gentleman you spoke about articulately today, Dr. Hardell, who has been harping for 35, 40 years on the cell industry about protecting consumers from that, to no avail. Dr. Davis, who you work with, is a colleague who basically, by default, she wasn't interested in cell phones, but when, during the Clinton administration, they chose to do a multi-million dollar study to see if American citizens would get brain tumors from cell phones, and it was fudged, and ethical Dr. Davis defudged it, she, as a good human being, basically stood up and said, I've got to teach people how damaging and dangerous this is. And probably one of the best lectures I've ever seen, she's not here with us, is on YouTube now at the University of Sydney by Dr. Davis. You may want to look at that, those of you here in the room and listening. No so this is an ever-growing, catastrophic concern that's going to amplify by 100 times. Now, is the Irish Brian embellishing this? I'm giving you a factual statement. So when I speak to the physicists and the electronic engineers, the doctors of electronics, 5G will amplify 4G, which was horrible to begin with, that much more. And you're going to have more of these towers closer and closer and closer to you. So all I can say to you, you can eat like I'm telling you to eat. You can exercise like I'm suggesting. You can have the greatest attitude in the world, and you're going to be sick if we allow this to continue. And if you don't protect yourself, and we'll get to those issues later. Okay, so let me ask two questions. First question is, what is 2G? Um, what is, I guess, uh, what is, I guess, I'm not sure of the Gs. So tell me what's 2G, 3G, and 4G. If there is a 3G, I don't know. But what's 2G, 3G, 4G? And then what's 5G? And what is the Internet of Things? And what benefits will that give us? So what's, what is the different Gs? 2G, 4G, 5G? And then what is the Internet of Things? And what are the benefits of that? So we can answer all of that. Yeah. Okay. This is your, okay. So take us through the G's up through 5G. So and then G stands for generation. 
as in, so 2G would be the second generation, and this is very important, of wireless technology, mm -hmm. wireless infrastructure. You're with me? We are now mostly in 4G, although 3G still operates, and 5G is sometimes going up um, in trial ways. This is not, I'm going to repeat, these Gs are not wired technologies, but that's complicated too, and all of this is way more complicated than um, certainly I understand, and I've been dealing with this for 20 years, and I should also say I am a kindergartner. I mean that, and I talk all day long with these engineers, um, and and I say, okay, here are the rules. I am a kindergartner. You are patient. <laughs> so like when they explain things to me, they have to do it multiple times. And then I'll tell you the people that I trust. The scientists I trust are the ones who tell me they do not understand what's going on. Whenever anybody tells me that they understand what's going on or they have a solution to the problem, my antenna go up. I do not trust that person at all. I figure they are trying to sell me something. And I don't believe it. So I'm really suspicious. I might be open to their ideas, but I don't trust it. I trust the people who say there's more going on than anyone understands. Um, OK, but let me, let me explain one thing. Most, in terms of infrastructure, the vast majority is delivered by fiber, which are pulses of light in cables that are usually buried, and it's difficult to bury them. But then there's the last mile that gets to your house, or, or like the fiber optics will be delivered to the cell tower, and then from the cell tower to whoever's here right now on a cell phone, that's wireless. Does that make sense? Okay, so some people are advocating that we want wired infrastructure delivered to the premises. Okay, G, generation, whenever you see G, that's wireless, there is wireless infrastructure involved. A difference between the first four generations of wireless infrastructure and 5G is that up to 4G and including 4G, if I'm AT&T and I want to put in wireless infrastructure and Brian owns, um, and it could be, you know, a quarter acre of land or whatever, it could, it, who knows what, it could be a church, it could be anything. And I want, I'm like, that looks like really good land that Brian has. I want to put a cell tower on Brian's land. Okay. I have to, so at first I make a contract with Brian. I'm AT&T, he's a landowner. I make a contract with him. And then um, I go to Brian's town council and I ask for a permit to install. And then what I described earlier, because of Section 704, no one can object because of health or environmental concerns. What's changing with 5G, although there, this is happening now also with 4G, federally we are passing orders and laws that allow installation of antennas on public right-of-ways. So those are utility poles, school rooftops, um, traffic lights. So we, the public, own public right-of-ways. You see the difference between private land that's owned and public right-of-ways. Right Most experts say that 
um, for 5G to work, and these are now millimeter waves that do not travel far, so they need to be densely deployed. So reports say we will need antennas from every 1 to 12 houses in order for 5G to work. Why do we need 5G? Well, there are multiple reasons. The simplest one is that corporations cannot die. And in order for, to keep corporations alive, we have to um, offer new stuff. And people have to buy the new stuff. The Internet of Things connects everything possible to the Internet. You can now buy diapers that have a chip in them that will send a message to your smartphone letting you know that your baby's diaper needs changing. That's machine-to-machine -machine communication. You can, and if you go to a store to buy a refrigerator, it's going to be hard not to, to, to find a refrigerator that is not Internet of Things connected. It's not a smart, you don't want a smart appliance. Um, but it would be able to let you know that your orange juice, which would also be chipped, needs a refill. And so when you're at the grocery store and you check on your smartphone, your refrigerator and your orange juice will send a message to your smartphone <laughs> You need more orange juice. Um, okay, then say you're driving around and um, there's a traffic jam up ahead, maybe a bad accident, you don't know about it, or maybe the roads are icy. Your car's windshield will f flash, not good to go your usual way, you need to change routes, here's what I suggest. So you understand machine-to-machine -machine communication now, the Internet of Things. I've only named, a f you know, not even anything of what that will cover. And uh, my understanding of why do we need this, it's to keep corporations alive. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, and I, okay, but, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. It's good. Okay. It's good. <laughs> Can I add on to something yeah, you please. said is we have a, a page on our website, ehtrust.org, of ridiculous Wi-Fi tech. Mm. And I haven't updated it recently, but um, we have uh, wireless tampons, uh, wireless speaker things that you can insert into you, um, teddy bears, Wi-Fi, Barbie. Um, it's really shocking how much stuff there is that they're chipping that is useless and that makes it makes no sense to me and it doesn't seem safe radiation aside uh, because like they found that some of these stuffed animals that are speaking then people can hack into them i mean there's so many that's like a whole other that's a whole other conference on cyber security um, Although, watch out for the Barbies that are telling the corporations what your children's best friends' names are, what your jobs are. Like, the, the Barbie doll will say, what is your mommy's job? Where do, who is your best friend? Where do you like to go after school? Right. And report back to the corporation. Right. And there have been, and when it's machine to machine, there's all these points where you can hack into as well. Uh, more points than than before when you know, everything was just going through the computer. And actually, you can look into that and see where they have hacked into Barbie, I believe, and as well um, into wireless, uh, those video monitors. And I didn't mention also baby monitors are a big source yes. of electromagnetic radio frequency radiation, wireless baby monitors as well. But back to 5G, one thing I wanted to say is it is confusing because you might go to a community meeting and the companies are talking all about 5G and they have to bring this new technology. And then when you try to drill down and find out, well, 
what kind of antennas are going up in front of my house on that street light? And you find out that it's 4G. They're not even putting in 5G right now. So it's like we're guinea pigs. They're experimenting with all kinds of stuff in different communities. I talk to people all over the country, and there's all kinds of different things happening. Um, although it definitely there is a small cell rollout, but in terms of what they're being told and how it's being developed and what it's being used for, you'll get different answers when you talk to the companies. But one thing is self-driving cars. As I understand it, in order to make that work, they need to have no. densely placed antennas. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands throughout the United States alone, not more. Right. <laughs> I'm going to try to go back to the initial question that Stephen asked, and uh, certainly not an expert, but one that speaks to the expert. I'll try to explain to you uh, in a simple way of what happened with from zero generation to what we're now being introduced to 5G. In our old way of thinking with electric, the more wires you had, the more electric you could dispense. So the old school system to speak about, everything was wired. If you dig up New York City, you're going to find every wire that's ever been placed below that for the millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people that have lived there from the beginning of electric. Then all what happened is the Pentagon began, began looking at the space program and finding ways to disconnect from structure. They said, you know, it costs a lot of money to put these cables in cost a lot of money for the, the labor and the material itself. So let's see if we can do things without wire. And that's where it all began. Now, if you attended my program yesterday, Quantum Human Biology, I gave you the history of life as we know it. That we came out of what? Frequencies. And so my colleague and friend taught me a long time ago that healthy cells work at 75 hertz. And although that's a very powerful hertz for your 100 trillion cells, the truth of the matter is it's very fragile. If I even put a subtle bit of frequency into that cell, it may start spinning in the wrong direction. It may not communicate with the other cells. It may not adhere to the cell next to it to make a strong heart, a strong liver. It may disturb the neurons in my brain, as we've seen from the work of Dr. Davis, Stanford, Exeter University, Yale University, etc. So where we've taken a quantum leap, it was horrible we went up to 4G, fourth generation, but the way I was taught to describe this, I'm going to describe this, and if you don't get it the first time around, I'll do it the second. This is important to understand. The frequency of water is what they based 4G on. Now that's pretty scary, because pretty much all living things that we know have water in it, including you. About 70% of you is water. So when the 4G, which is widely employed globally, most of you sitting here and listening to me globally, have 4G devices that you're using. Every single time you employ that in close proximity to your body or you're near a cell tower where thousands of people in your neighborhood or community are employing it, the 75 hertz is being challenged by 4G. We're becoming less structural with 5G. Why it's 100 times worse, they're basing this on the frequency of, wa of not water, but oxygen. So remember, water is hydrogen and oxygen. They got rid of the hydrogen on this one. Oxygen's more etheric. What does that mean? Less structure. Every living thing depends upon oxygen. And the transport of life 
from life depends upon oxygen. And it's a more fundamental concern because in seven minutes your body without oxygen dies. It takes three to four days without water. So now we're working at a much more fragile and subtle frequency, which interesting enough amplifies the concern. So the less structure you have, the more problem it is for healthy biological cells. So that's hopefully allowing you to understand why this is becoming more pervasive, more problematic, and it will cause more disorders, both physical and emotional disorder. Um, what do the studies show? How does EMR or electromagnetic radiation exposure impact our health? Could you tell us about the findings of the National Toxicology Program study and the medical community's response to these findings? What about the media's response to these findings? Theodora just gave such an excellent talk about that. Um, you know what, Can we, should we just go on to, oh, okay. cause, and then we'll get Let's more covered, on. yeah. Um, um, how does man-made electromagnetic radiation impact our food supply? Hmm. To take that. Um, I have a list of things. <laughs> <laughs> so first, as Theodora reported, we know that bees are impacted and other pollinators. Um, bees have cryptochrome. Listen to the language. Cryptochrome is magnetically sensitive protein in the eyes, magnetically sensitive. They use it to determine due north. What happens with bee colony collapse disorder is the bees just disappear. We don't see dead bodies, we don't see sick bodies, they just disappear. So that's a navigational problem. Cryptochrome is impacted by radio frequency radiation. And so the scientists that have been publishing about this say we need to include radio frequency radiation as part of the problem, along with the varroa mite and harsh winters and other things, pesticides. We also need to include radio frequency radiation as a contributor to um, colony collapse disorder. Then um, John Deere, the tractor maker, and Monsanto, the GMO producer, they got married a few years ago. I don't know if you heard about it. <laughs> they now make these tractors that are, are there any farmers in the audience? Yes? Okay. The, um, these tractors are packed with computers. And while they drive over a little parcel of land or a big parcel of land, the computers access the cloud, and they can tell exactly the moisture content, the mineral content, the weather predicted for the, I don't know, the next few months, and then they can tell the farmer or whoever's driving the tractor exactly the kind of fungicide, pesticide, seed, um, every, everything, fertilizer, you name it, that is needed to plant for the largest, most lucrative harvest for that parcel of land, and they will dispense the seeds. These are very expensive tractors. But all of those computers are crunching numbers in very fast time. So what would they need? And there, by the way, you can't put a wire, you can't attach a wire to the tractor for that to work. You need a wireless infrastructure for those computers in the tractor to work. So that's another reason that we need 5G, is for those tractors 
to be able to access the data quickly and wirelessly. I could keep going, but um, those are a couple ways. <laughs> you, you know what, skip the, skip the clapping and then we'll get more questions. You can clap at the end. <laughs> so, <clears throat> one of the um, goals of the Real Truth About Health Conference is that although there's a lot of very interesting scientific information, the ultimate question that a lot of us have is, what do we need to do to totally stay safe? We don't want cancer, we don't want MS, we don't want diabetes, we don't want anything. So a lot of us aren't even that conscious. So if you were going to really, in other words, I'm constantly thinking to myself, I'm in a car and the person next to me has a cell phone. I'm in a car and my son is texting. I'm in a car and my son is streaming. I'm in a room and other people have a cell phone. I'm in the house and the cell phone's on, but it's 300 feet away. The wireless is on, but it's not near me. So the question is, if you were going to, you know, forgetting about the details, assuming we just wanted to know how to protect ourselves, what are the things we, so we understand we don't, that holding a cell phone to our ear is not recommended. So aside from holding a cell phone to our ear, what are all the, all the other things that we should be conscious of and be trying like as hard as we can to avoid, to avoid exposure to EMFs? Uh, um, yeah, okay. Everybody's sitting on the edge of the seat. What, what were you gonna say? I'm go gonna answer it, but you Go can, ahead, go ahead. Go, go. I'll, I'll do some and then you add on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that once you wake up to this issue that cell phones and wireless devices emit radiation, you can start to think differently and make, I'm gonna start with some easy changes and, and go to some harder ones, because again, meaningful lasting change is gonna be policy change. In order to keep us safe from 5G and these cell towers going up, the personal changes we make are not gonna be enough, but I wanna to talk to you about them. Like to start with, in this room, a lot of people have cell phones on. Some of you might have a cell phone in your pocket, you can turn them off. In fact, we should be turning them off because that will decrease, like right now you can take it out, power it off, and that decreases the electromagnetic radiation in the room that's affecting us and also people who might be sensitive to those fields in the room. Um, not having it on your body, keeping a distance is a first start. But there's, if I'm in a car, all the phones are off. That's what we do as much as we can. There have been times where that hasn't been the case, but in my car that I own and in my house, I can say what I want to happen in my home and in my car. Um, so the problem is that's easier said than done because maybe there's a work thing or maybe there's something that's come up and people say, how, how do I do that? Um, but, but we have to start talking about this and making those changes. When I um, go to, actually when I go to find a, a hotel room and I'm in charge of picking it, I try to find one that has a wire and if they don't, sometimes I write the hotel about that. Um, the smart meter, I went through in my talk a number of things we can do in terms of getting this, the digital and wireless smart meter off of your home. And if you're in a state, well that's the utility meter that gives you your bill that measures the electricity you're using. If you're in a state where you don't have an opt out, um, then get organized with a local group and get an opt-out, but that's actually not good enough. What we need is a fully wired infrastructure ultimately, or for everyone to be able to have an analog, a non-radiating meters. Um, I actually have a list here of a bunch of personal things you can do, uh, but they only affect you in your home. Ultimately, we have to work educate people and starting making changes both how we use devices, how people in our community use devices, and how our government addresses this issue. And think about 
things we might not have thought about before. Like someone wants to, you're hanging out with someone. It used to be, oh, let me show you this video, like with teenagers. Let me show you this. Let me show you that. All that has to shift because why do we need to be, especially if it's a, a funny cat video or something, that radiation is going into the person holding the phone, the people nearby, and all the people in the path of the tower. Although it is decreased, it is still significant. So it's a, it's a whole mind shift, actually. Kind of a journey, I feel like people go on. I don't know, did you want to add, I'm sure you have more things to add to that. You can go first. Okay. Um, I heard a year ago about um, there's this guy named Bill Torbert who's a retired business management professor from Boston University. And he says, if you're not aware that you are part of the problem, then you cannot be part of the solution. So that helps me a lot. Um, and because there is so much that, you know, we, we are all at the mercy of forces beyond our control. So I have to look at my part of the problem and go from there. Um, Stephen, I'm also going to say, when you asked the question, you said, and I don't know if you heard yourself say it, but you said, what can we do to keep totally safe? Do you remember saying that? Yes, yes. Okay. And, um, I don't believe that that's possible. <laughs> that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, but, but acknowledging that is a, is a sea change. And so, um, it sounds like you have children. And so, as a parent, of course, you want to protect your children and your whole family. And so, recognizing our powerlessness is a major step. Um, there's just, you know, and, and we're all, the focus so far has been on personal devices. And we, we can have control there a little bit, except, you know, if you have a child. I know children, you know, who are raised with all the best intentions, and if they don't have a smartphone by the time they're eight years old, they are ready for, you know, pure revolution, right? Revolt. Um, yeah. Um, so, there, there's very little control that we have as far as I can see. So that is one of my questions again. What, what control do we have? I'm going to tell a story about a paper I have on my website. It's called Calming Behavior in Children with Autism and ADHD. Um, one of the people I report on is a pediatrician in the Bay Area where I've heard reports that boys are, like 50% of boys have autism. Um, there are some people who, who believe that that's what's happening. So this pediatrician sees a lot of children with autism and ADHD. And she came up with this free protocol. I'm going to tell you the whole recipe. Turn your Wi-Fi off for at least 12 hours every night while you sleep. Don't let the child within eight feet of a cordless phone or a wireless device. And unplug everything in your bedroom. Don't just turn it off, unplug it. You'll notice that this protocol is free. I do not have any gizmo to sell. I am very suspicious of gizmos. I believe in unplugging. A lot of people tell me it's not possible to turn the Wi-Fi off at night because then you don't have a phone and you need emergency um, service, whatever. So then you, you need to be reachable for emergencies. So that's, you know, if you can, get a wired, corded phone. In a lot of areas, including in Brooklyn, phones are, landlines are being shut off with no warning. Like people just pick up the phone and there's no dial tone. So this is happening all over the country. Again, we don't have power. Okay, I want to go back to this pediatrician. She had a, um, a boy 
in, who came to her for care. He was 10 years old. He had never spoken. He screamed every night from 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. This fam he was really aggressive. This family lived on a military base. And the pediatrician said, forget it. With background radiation levels at a military base, there is no way that my protocol is going to help you at all. And this family was desperate. You can imagine having a child screaming every night from 10 p.m. till 3 a.m. And so all they did was turn off their Wi-Fi. Three days later, they, they only turned it off at night. They turned it back on during the day. Three days later, this boy spoke a complete sentence. Now, we don't say there was a cause and effect. Um, I'll also tell you that this family was really encouraged, and so they started turning a lot more off. They stayed on the military base. The, um, the pediatrician put the boy on a therapeutic grade fish oil, and three weeks later, he slept through the night. Okay, again, I'm not saying this is the cause. We don't have any, any peer-reviewed studies of this. I will say this experiment is free, and you can try it for two weeks and see it if, if it changes for you, for the situation you have. We do know other families that have had children diagnosed with autism as toddlers. They unplug all the wireless stuff in their own homes, and by the time the children are teenagers, I, I know one family where the children no longer have autism. Um, and I know people who have had, you know, teeny tiny changes from doing this. So I'm telling you some dramatic stories, um, but you can do the experiment yourself. Don't clap I, until the end. Can, I, I think to go back again to Stephen's initial question, uh, the first and foremost device we all should be concerned about is a cell phone. How many of you sitting here in this auditorium ha do not have a cell phone? Okay, so out of a, a couple of hundred people here, we have seven or eight that do not. And I think that that's probably worldwide about what you'd see. Probably a, a one percent or half a percent. So when using a cell phone, it should be placed on a table on speaker, not near your bosom. As Dr. Davis showed us photos out of Stanford University, there's a rare new form of cancer because young women put it in their brassiere. Somehow they think that that's the place you keep cell phones. Uh, Yale and then Exeter, uh, the week I was addressing groups at Exeter in England, uh, confirmed the same number. Uh, that boys who put the cell phones in their pocket have within 30 seconds a 40% reduction in sperm activity. And both confirm the same number, so this is a done deal. So that's number one. I totally agree with what you said, but I'll be a little bit more forceful because there is empirical evidence on this, and Europe is far ahead of us. I spent a lot of time in Europe there. Um, what we have to understand is Science is sort of problematic in many ways because it tends not to be uh, controlled by common sense in any way. People are afraid to take a step forward and to move out of the grips of insanity because there's not enough evidence that we can do that and it should be done in the right way because the legal system pretty much controls and manipulates the scientific community and corporations pretty much fund 95% of all corporate studies. So that's what, what's going on. In Europe, where there's a little more humanity still left, they are successfully using scalar waves, which are even more subtle waves to attract the less subtle wa waves, these problematic frequencies that now we're all surrounding ourselves. We're bathing in, forget surrounding ourselves with. We're bathing in and it's getting worse all of the time. The more population of the world, you're gonna have more of this, by the way. What happens if we go to 15 billion people by the end of this century? And you think we're just going to be using cell phones now? Uh, I was shocked uh, when I was at a conference and somebody showed me that infants who can't sit up and speak 
have computers that they're playing with at three months old and with no protection on these computers. Uh, I don't think that we can call everything gizmos. Let me give you a little bit of earth science. Uh, radiation comes from something called uranium. Uranium is a rock. So we're all radiation initiated from is a rock. There are rocks, by the way, when you look at geology, that pretty much block the radioactivity that's coming from the uranium. And so those rocks can be affixed to your devices. And this dramatically doesn't eliminate it, but dramatically reduces the output of that negative frequency. It acts like a lightning rod. You don't take lightning away. You attract lightning to it rather than your biofrequency field, all of the cells that you so well spoke about, that work at 75 hertz. So there are ways to protect yourself. There are devices that you can put around your neck. I've been wearing such devices for 35 years. Uh, my wife is one of the world's leading authorities on cellular research, and we watched what happened when we put these devices like high pulse around our neck versus when we don't have them. And Lerolo, where cells come together because of electromagnetic frequency, you put the devices and they dramatically shift. They go back. So rather than say, let's wait and see what we can do to protect ourselves, let's use what we do know works today. And it's becoming far less expensive than it was at one point. Uh, when we moved into a house 20 years ago, uh, we found out that from Gauss meters, this is something you may want to buy, and if a Gauss meter that's $200 is too expensive, buy a $5 transistor radio and put it off the station. Don't have a station on. And as you go into a room, it will pick up the electromagnetic frequency by going shh. The less frequency, the less sound you're going to see. And so we found out the room my little baby daughter at that point, who's now 33, was sleeping in, uh, she was being zapped at incredibly high amounts of electric. And we went out and we bought at Home Depot, by the way, they didn't have it in stock, a lead wall piece. So rather than the wall piece you normally put up, lead. Lead stops radioactivity. This is why when you're in an MRI center, by law they have to put lead around the MRI room because it's emitting radioactivity. And why when you go to the dentist and they're doing an x-ray, they stick lead around your neck, it's because it stops radiation. So let's not sit and wait on our hands. Let's move forward. We are at the cutting edge of these understandings. Sadly, a lot of these technologies today to protect you are very expensive, and they're becoming less expensive as go. The ones that aren't are the most important ones. The ones you put on your phone, the ones you put in your router, the one I put in my Tesla car, less expensive. Okay, uh, regarding 5G, I forgot to announce this before we started. There is a group in Long Island that is organizing to fight against 5G, so if anyone in this audience is moved by this and feels passionate and strongly about 5G and you wanna speak and meet and help with this problem on Long Island, there's a group of passionate people dealing with this and it would be great if you would say hello to them and talk to them and talk about getting involved. So they have a booth over there in the right and you want, maybe you guys wanna hold up your hand so they can see you get, meet them after and uh, go uh, over to their booth and sign up to find out how to be connected so you could follow up with this energy. And, and do they have a website? Okay, can, can you tell us what the website is? Okay. Citizens for 5G Awareness. So on Facebook, it's Citizens for 5G Awareness. I'm going to give a second group that's working globally on this. It's called In Power Movement. In Power Movement dot com. And there are ways that you can protect yourself from this. Um, uh, just hold, hold on. Oh, no, no. I just want to stay with this. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make a couple announcements about what's going on federally. So, um, and you can tell your congressional representatives and senators to, about these, call them about these two House resolutions. Um, so, House Resolution 7, this is in the Federal Congress, 
7236, it would severely limit the liability of telecom corporations for injury caused by exposure to radiation emitted by telecom equipment if the corporation complies with FCC determined radiofrequency radiation emissions. I've kind of shortened it a lot, but basically call your representatives and say vote no on 7236 and I will tell you phoning does matter. Um, so I don't know if you follow, but basically that means if someone is injured by an antenna that a telecom corporation puts up, say next to your child's bedroom or whatever, that is happening, um, then the telecom corporations would not be liable as long as they are in compliance, as long as the emissions of radiation from that antenna are in compliance with FCC rules. So we want to vote no on House Resolution 7236. Then, um, Congresswoman Eshoo from California has proposed a, another bill. It's called Preservation of Rights of States and Local Governments. This is H.R. 530. It would prevent the FCC's orders, numbers 18111 and 18133. And these allow telecoms to hire non-union workers, to install equipment on poles, and the other one allows, um, it, it removes local authority over telecom facilities. Okay, this House Resolution 530 would, um, it would prevent these orders from having any force or effect. So they want to vote yes on 530, HR 530. When, when are these coming up for vote, do you know? Um, we don't know. There, so there was the Streamline Act in the last Congress, but it is not, which is awful, but um, it hasn't been reintroduced. So these have been introduced and, you know, we've kind of had a little bit of a shutdown problem recently. So give so, both of them again, if you will. Um, so I don't know when they will be, um, you know, up for, up for a vote. They're in, they are introduced. We don't know when they'll be up for a vote. So vote no on H.R. 7236 and vote yes on H.R. 530. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I understand that you guys have delved deeply into the science, and I know there are some people that would like to know the science hardcore, but for a lot of us who are just everyday people, we again are just trying to figure out what are we really saying. If I got in my car and you guys started smoking cigarettes, I would say you can't smoke in the car. And if my children were in the car, I would say you can't. And no matter what you said, I would stop the car and go, you can't smoke in the car with my kids. So I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you saying like, this isn't so great and you know, see what you could do? Or are you saying never have a cell phone to your head, like, am, is it okay if it's on a speakerphone? Is it okay if it's in the car? If my son's texting, like, I want to go into the nitty gritty because that's the, I'm, you know, I'm already sold that, that EMFs are bad and I'm sold that 5G's a nightmare. Other people might not be, but I am. So if I want to know what I can do tonight, you know, what are the rules? If the cell phone, you know, from, starting from my head, I hear that that's bad. From there, is it okay if it's on the table? Is it okay if it's in another room? Is it okay if it's just the Wi-Fi? Is it okay if my son's just streaming music in the back? Like, are we, like right now, I'm trying to have a nice relationship with my wife, and I tell her that we gotta turn the Wi-Fi off, and the cell phone's gotta be, and everyone, including her <laughs> friends and family, is thinking I'm extreme and nutty, and I'm trying to decide if I'm extreme and nutty, or if I'm responsible and healthy, so. Steve, you already know the answer to that I don't know, I, do, I know not to hold it to my head, but I don't no, know. No, I'm saying, are you extreme and nutty? Yes. Okay. Not really. <laughs> I, I, I am to society, I actually think I'm very rational and making good decisions. Okay. But I'm trying to understand if there's a cell phone on in the yeah. other room, yeah. is that a big deal? If someone's got this, if I'm on speakerphone, is that a big deal? If someone's texting, like, 
try to, you know, if they're using the cordless, if they have Alexa on, like, how serious are we supposed mm. to take, is this cigarette smoke? Am I supposed to be all out against EMF? Or are you saying, as long as it's not to your head, it's like, give me more details about just me protecting myself every day, all day, you know, tell me all the details. My kids want to have wireless earbuds. You know, I don't know if I'm being extreme or if I'm being rational. What do, what do you think? Can, can I say that first wireless earbuds are putting radiation into your head? There's also a way that one connects to the other and then they connect to the phone and you're getting even more radiation. I wish it were so easy in terms of the changes you make, but what we do know that is easy to know is that we do not know what a safe level is, and it should be as low as possible. And that doesn't mean that everyone just keeps the phone off the body. I wish it did. It would be simple if that were the answer. But at this point, we have an emergency situation because of the amount of devices there is no faster growing environmental pollution than wireless right now. And it's not just the cell phones. It's the cell phones, the cell towers, the virtual assistants, all of these devices you brought in. And it's not going to be as easy in your home as maybe other issues that have come up. But it is doable, and you have to start somewhere. So getting everything wired that you can so that no one's complaining, I need to use the internet and I can't use the internet right now. I mean, using a wired computer does, does not mean no internet connection. A lot of people think Wi-Fi wi means internet. And if I say, turn the Wi-Fi off, they're like, what? <laughs> no, you know? And if someone told me, you can't have the internet, I also would be like, wait, I've gotta do my work, I've gotta do my things. But I do it with a wire. Now, this does get confusing. And here, people came up to me, every talk I do, people come up to me and they say, how do I do that? And I would like to hand them one single thing that makes it easy, but actually, it's complicated depending on your carrier. It gets a little complicated. You actually have to spend some time figuring out first, where is your router? Some people say to me, what's that? How what, 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 I, you know, you're, we're, you're going to have to learn some things about this technology that we just have used, you know, and uh, it's going to take a little work, but it's worth it because it is about our children. And I, I do, I'll say personally, in my house, we don't have any wireless devices and it took time. I'd like to tell you that I heard about this and the next day I fixed everything and it actually took some time for me to learn how to fix some things. The first thing I did is stop using my cell phone and start using my phone, my cordless home phone because I hadn't learned everything properly. <laughs> and I used my cordless phone thinking this was better, but it's not. The decked phone is emitting radiation. It wasn't until I got a, a meter to measure what was in my house and I started walking around my house and I was like, oh my, this thing is radiating? And then for, so the first thing to do is get an inventory. Number one, what is emitting radiation in your home? <laughs> You'll be amazed. And then for each thing, you say, what options do I have to hardwire it? And what changes can I make? So if you have, um, you know, phones are actually easy. Getting the corded phone, connection with the curly wire, not a corded, cordless phone. But then you've got gaming systems I've had. It really depends on the system. I would advocate, if you can, to get a meter so that you can start measuring devices um, because things can be hardwired. Also, spe your speaker. Your, uh, you might have a computer that has a mouse. Use a corded mouse. Use a corded, um, the thing you type on, the keypad. There's all these things you have in your home and you can go by one by one and start swapping them out. But what we really need, and there's, there's people who can't afford to do that. This is a luxury and that's not right. So what we really need is people who have some time 
to petition these companies to make safer technology that's accessible and reasonable. So when I go to the store, because right now I can't even go to a store to buy most things. I have to search on the internet to find the wired speaker for my daughter's uh, computer so that she can listen to music and not have it be with the Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi. It should be like you walk in a store and you can buy it. So this is like a simple thing. Someone make a petition and go wild on it. Get yourself on camera talking about how important this is, and you'll wake people up, um, put pr some pressures on the company. So do an inventory of your house and make those changes. You can certainly hire someone, if you choose to, a building biologist to come and do measurements in your home and come up with some more, more complicated changes that you'll need to make, especially if you're near antennas. Be careful about shielding because you could be bouncing something off another wall. So you always want to know your electromagnetic environment, what it is, where things are coming from, and if you make changes, you want to test after. Um, but I, I believe that making everything wired that you can is the answer, and that takes a little time to do throughout your house, and you got to get buy-in from people. Sometimes you might not, but turning it off at night is a great start, actually. And I found so many people, and our family included, maybe some family members that were a little skeptical, did say, you know, I sleep a lot better at night now that we dealt with that. Um, so, and please check out all the, the, the papers that we have that have easy first steps. Um, on how to reduce exposure, I have a lot in the back. And that's what I would absolutely start with. And it can be done, and I don't think it's kooky at all. It's radiation. And, on, and a cell phone over here might be reduced, but it would be, it's still, you're still exposing yourself, especially if you're in a low signal. It's better to get a corded situation. It's, it's extreme. Uh, not to consider this. It's abusive to your children, your family, and in my case, my co-workers. I have 200 co-workers. I've spent tens of thousands of dollars to protect them. They're sitting in front of computers. They're on a property. I brought physicists in. We put together machines we created at the Hippocrates Center with scalar waves on the property. And these are measurable changes we've made. Thank God, friends of ours, German friends of ours, gave us phones that admit no EMF. And you can purchase these on the internet. And there's more than one company that does this. And wiring your home is by far the best. And yes, it's more expensive. It's outrageous. What used to be everyone, now you have to go and find these things like they're obscure. It was just 10 years ago we all had wires in our house. Right. This is incredibly important. And let me say, I cannot emphasize, look at I'm known as a health authority. You can eat perfect, you can exercise, you can have the greatest life in the world. You will get sick if you don't protect yourself from electromagnetic field radiation. This is radiation, as she just said. How many of you would jump in the middle of Chernobyl and hang out there for a week? Well, you're sticking cell phones and routers to you in front of a computer eight hours a day. You're living in a major city with cell towers on four corners of your home. I mean, this is outrageous, and we individually and as, as a society have to do something about this. Um, so in relation to what you were asking, um, every, there's no straight answer, because everyone is in a unique situation. So like right now, you've got a tablet with you, and the microphone, and both of these are emitting. And then we're in a room with, we're in a hotel with Wi-Fi. There are actually antennas and satellites on the roof of this building, and there are antennas on the buildings surrounding. Um, and, and then there's stuff we don't know about. There are likely smart meters here. Um, there's so we don't know about the combined effects and 
when, and then the cumulative effect. So when did you start using wireless devices? When did, you know, and um, everyone's in a unique situation. And then your diet and your physical makeup, like my head is smaller than Brian's head. And so different waves are going to resonate with my size differently than the next person. Um, and so everyone's different and everyone's awareness is different and, and what, everyone, what, what every one of us needs is different, which is to say we're on, you know, at, at, at a significant level we're on our own to figure out what's right. I do believe in unplugging as the first medicine and the continued medicine. There's another book I can recommend called Reset Your Child's Brain by Victoria Dunkley. She's an MD child psychiatrist. She had so many children coming to her with autism and psychosis, and she, was in, she is in Los Angeles, and she couldn't tell what is going on. And so she said, until and unless the child does a three-week electronic fast, I can't give a proper diagnosis. And all the parents said, no way, that's not possible to do a three-week electronic fast. And she said, okay, you want another meltdown? And the parents said, no. And so they tried this three-week electronic fast. And then within those three weeks, a lot of children's problems cleared up 100%. Her book, again, is Reset Your Child's Brain. She explains something very important for children. I'm not really directly um, answering your question, Steve, but this is very important. That is, interactive um, screen time is much more hazardous to children's d brain development than passive TV. Interesting. And this is kind of counterintuitive, yeah. but um, one of my buddies, Jerry Mander, who wrote for arguments for the elimination of television in 1978, he described, so if I'm a TV and I'm, I'm a train coming at you, you are emotionally going to react, you know, like your fear is going to say, whoa, there's a train coming at me. If you're a child with a developing brain seeing this train coming at you, the brain has to adjust to the thought, wait, that's not real. I'm fe feeling scared, that part's real, but the train isn't real. And that's very confusing for the child's brain as it is developing to, take, to do those thoughts at the same time. Okay, now put a mouse in the child's hand. So the train is coming at me, but because I've got a mouse here, I can manipulate the train so it crashes into Brian or to the, the building next to me or whatever, or to you. That's another adjustment for my brain to determine what's real. And, and most children cannot, I, I mean, no, ch you know, it, even adults, that, it's just really confusing. But if that's happening when a child's brain is developing, you understand that interactive screen time, <clears throat> pardon me, is much more hazardous than passive TV, which is dangerous enough. Okay, so this woman wrote, she's got all studies, all the studies um, that show this in her book, Reset Your Child's Brain, and she explains how to do the fast and then how to reintroduce electronics after the fast. So again, I believe in unplugging and fasting and adults can do this too. And I will repeat to beware of shielding. Like um, a lot of people have shields on their phones and the environmental working group found that the shields on phones can actually increase exposure by 60%. There are so many things that we're not aware of. And um, you know things can get introduced that you don't know about when you've got the meters around. There are, just, there are lots of frequencies that you may not be testing for, so unplug. That is the number one rule for me. Can I add one quick thing, which is in, a, in addition to 
at home at, and at work, at school, is super critically important because children spend the majority of their daytime in schools. And I talked about this in my talk as well. Um, uh, and you can also watch the webinar I was referencing this uh, with the San Francisco Teachers Union that we did where we go more into depth, but the radiation exposure in schools is very intense, especially the intense peaks of all those access points that are placed, and where do you get 30 kids all on devices which are all radiating along with maybe they all have phones, maybe there's smartwatches, maybe there's iPods that are wireless, all of this in a contained space in just one room, because in all the other rooms there's also uh, devices that are on, and um, it's pretty unprecedented, actually. And this is an area that I also think is so important that parents and teachers and administrators start looking at, because wireless should not be in schools. Schools should be wired. It can be done. In other countries, like Cyprus has removed the Wi-Fi from elementary schools. France has it um, off, only on, uh, for if a teacher needs to use it for a specific time, and they have wired systems. There's a lot of private schools that are removing the wireless. Um, and it might take a while for public schools to to catch up with that, but that's not good enough for our kids because our kids are in school now, so something needs to be done now. In China, for in Shidong province, 40% mm. of the children have myopia. Oh. And so last November, this province, which is large, instituted a rule. N no cell phones in school, and no child can spend more than 15 minutes in one session with a computer, and no more than a total of one hour per day with electronics. That happened last November in Shidong province in China. And we have a list, uh, we have a web page which is on schools banning cell phones. Um, we also have a, one on schools reducing Wi-Fi, but we have a list of other different schools and districts that are looking at that because of the impact, all the different impacts on kids, but especially it is not conducive to learning. And because getting outside with myopia, which is accelerating at a rapid pace, and the one thing that research shows over and over again, kids getting outside decreases their risk of myopia. Their eyes are looking at all different things. They're rather than when you're just staring at a screen like this to the young developing eye, this is not healthy. And in schools especially, all of these devices are coming out with any medical guidelines, really health and safety guidelines on how to use how to use technology safely. Not to mention that research shows that it doesn't support learning objectives. Exactly. The all of this one on one device using tablets and devices in every classroom. This is I hope that people take some time to look more into this issue and take some action on it. What, what, what is just being mentioned by these two experts, uh, let's spend a minute to repeat the importance of this. So what you're suggesting is on your website. Could you give that to us? Oh, it's ehtrust.org and um, environmental health trust. That she has mm -hmm. schools that have done this. Mm -hmm. Those of you sitting in this room that purport, at least, that you're conscious and aware of the importance of this, it's your obligation to approach your child, your grandchild's school, and bring this about with examples. Uh, a few years ago, I reported a, a university, and I'm sorry, I forget the name, in Ohio, that they went off the wireless. Um, everyone listening around the world, I mean, the same thing. I'm putting a responsibility in your hands. The way things change is not sit and get riled up and get ulcers over this. You've got to approach the authorities. You do have control. And as you so well said earlier, you'd be surprised how few people it takes to stop bad legislation.
Okay, so I'd, I'd like to ask you, if, assume that some people say, okay, I'm sold. Sounds bad. I don't like EMFs. I don't like 5G. Um, and they go home and they tell their family, listen, let's forget about Wi-Fi and EMFs. They're not good. And their family says, what are you talking about? There's no proof. So with all the, I guess, what is the best answer? How many studies have there been? What's the best study? What's the answer when someone says, there's never been any proof, there's never been any studies? What, what's the best, best answer, number one, of has there been, is there proof that Wi-Fi and EMFs are bad for us? And number two, what solutions exist? Can we buy a very big pyramid made of a certain kind of rock that I see at a New Life Expo, and the guy says it's a special, you know, anti-EMF thing. Um, Deborah Davis in the past has said the things that I wear around my neck, there's no proof they work. Is there, you know, is there devices, are there stones, are there something that I could put in my house, on my neck, on my body that protect me from EMF? So those are the two questions. What are the studies that prove this? And what can I, is there anything you could buy if you're willing to spend the money that does protect you from EMFs? I guess I'll start with the science part. You'll hear that a lot. There's no science. There are thousands of peer-reviewed and published scientific studies that show adverse effects. We made a page on our website, ehtrust.org, Environmental Health Trust, that has the top, top studies that probably needs to be updated, but it's got some good ones that you can share with people who say, there's no science. There's so much science, you could just delve in and never come out That's right. of the science. That's right. And That's when, right. I, right, when I first learned about this, I didn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. And I actually decided to look at the science and pretend like um, you know, I understood what in the world uh, frequency was, because at that time, I did not, which is really interesting. Um, and I could not believe, I had so many piles of paper, I would print out the abstracts, I could read them and highlight and learn what was 2.45 gigahertz and, and then go to, and, and look it up and find out what it was. And it's amazing how much science there is. Um, we also have a page um, that goes through different health effects and then has a sampling of like 10 studies for each one, like headaches, of which there are numerous studies linking radio frequency to headaches, um, uh, oxidative stress or um, uh, blood-brain barrier, uh, just cancer. Uh, there's the Bioinitiative Report, um, which reviews peer-reviewed published science um, and on different endpoints and different issues. That's an important resource as well. There's plenty of science. What you need is people's attention so that they can handle what you're talking to them about um, and begin that dialogue and conversation. With authorities, they need to be given all the science and they need to be accountable on this issue. But for your friends and family, it, I know that it's challenging, but I find that once you start, you'll see people will start coming back to you and saying, you know, you said, you were talking about this cell phone, and I'm getting headaches. And do you think that's what could be going on? Um, or you know, now now there's a cell tower proposed in my front yard, and I want to talk to you more about this issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, so begin that process in your community. I I have. Um, let me give another website, and then um, um, saferemr.org. Yes is posted by a public health researcher at UC Berkeley, Dr. Joel Moskowitz, oh, and that's an excellent listing of peer-reviewed studies along with the bioinitiative, bioinitiative.org um, and ehtrust.org. And I'm going to say that I find humility to be a really underrated and important aspect mechanism that we need here. Um, I hear stories all the time of people who go to their school and talk with the teacher, talk with the principal, talk with the school board, and they get ridiculed. I have personally testified in my 
you know, at my school board where they want to upgrade the technology and all, you know, the teachers and the students will all get up and say, we love this, we want this, we, you know, why would you not spend money on this? And I'll get up and report on the studies. And then the next day in the newspaper, um, Crazy I'll, be, I'll be quoted for, for, being, um, for having some concerns, but being in support of, the, of uh, buying the new technology. So, and I don't think that's a hostile situation I think it's that people can't really hear that there's a problem. And so I take it on myself that if someone reacts to me in a way that I'm not in concert with, that means that I have delivered the message in a way that they can't hear, and that's what I have control of, is the way that I deliver the information. So I have to go into a space where I really listen to them and I have to hear where I can meet them. This is the hardest thing to do for me because I'm sitting here with all this information, but it doesn't do doodly squat if I'm with a person who, you know, where what I'm saying isn't registering. And I've, I've been on that receiving end a lot myself. So basically, I make myself a listener and I am just constantly telling myself that I do not know what this person needs or how to, you know, how to hear it. And my job is to hear them so that I can say, oh, okay, here, here's a window. That's my job, is to, to make myself a listener. That's a really good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. <laughs> Stephen, you're about ready to have the audience ask questions? Yes. Good. Second part of my question, though, was is there any device, is there any rock, stone, anything, anything no, I could no. put around my neck? Is no. there anything <laughs> that will help? Well, I certainly no. believe so because I, <laughs> I read the science from several different areas. I don't only look at conventional science done at universities. I look at geology. I look at natural history. I look at quantum physics. I study quantum physics. I write about quantum physics. And from that, there's an awful lot. Uh, again, I wouldn't have spent tens of thousands of dollars over decades protecting Hippocrates' team as well as the guest that entrust their lives to us many times if I didn't trust this and believe it. There are physicists that think way out of the box and they understand the importance of these things. Uh, right here in this room you have devices that have been proven to be effective. Doctor, I'm wearing one around my neck. Dr. Valer, German, who studied with the Russians, created this and they went to, back to zero-point gravity, which is the basis of uh, let's say, the way that the universe works. And they found ways to put that figurative lightning rod on you so that, by the way, the electromagnetic hazards hit, you, hit that rather than hit you. So there are devices and there are shields and there's things. Another colleague of ours has a, a large business in North Carolina. Uh, he just spent uh, $25,000, $28,000 two months ago uh, testing new devices for protection on every one of the desks of all of his employees and found that there was a reduction of 88 percent radiation coming from these devices. So, you know, I always petition people to think beyond our own limitation, including myself sometimes. All of us say, that's baloney, as I thought it was baloney when people said to me they were affected by electromagnetics. It took me years by ignorance and default to say, hey, these people are sick. Okay, so as you know, we have this organization, Citizens for 5G Awareness, and we have Take Action Tuesday, where we ask our group to contact a local representative or a federal senator or a state senator, and we give them something to say and ask them to join us. And we just heard 10 minutes ago um, from Swazi's staff member who came tonight that he's gotten more phone calls in the past 
three weeks about 5G than they've gotten on any other issue ever. And, <laughs> and he'd like to speak to us tomorrow morning. And so what is your advice? Because apparently, here's what Swazi, I wrote this down. Swazi wants to know, uh, Congressman Swazi, what's, he wants to know with any issue, what's the answer? Do I have the guts to do it? And how do I win? That's what his staff member told me. So do you have advice on how we can help him to, you know, to move this forward? This is a, a federal congressman. I think that's a great example of how change can happen because he had the guts to call you because people had the courage to call him because your group started, got the word out when there was no word going out, and look at what's happened. Now you're on his radar and he's like, look, people care about this. When federal officials know their constituents care by commu this communication, they will respond. They're not going to do it. I've gone down to the hill, whoa, going back a long time, and other people have before me. And how many times have I heard, oh, there's nothing I can do. You really need to bring more people in here. So just bring it. Bring everyone and tell them what you want, which is to have control of your rights of way and decisions about where these antennas are going to be placed. And everything that you know about the uh, health issues of 5G and wireless, and what's he going to do? I mean, am I missing anything? And, and everything that you talked about with the bills as well, of course. So, <laughs> so definitely tell him to, su to support H.R. 530 um, and no on 7236. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go another level with this question. And so I think we have to look at why are we doing this? Why are we going to build out 5G? Um, there's a book. You can get it for free online. The website is Getting Smarter About the Smart Grid. The book is called Reinventing Wires by Tim Sheckley. That's S-C-H... O-E-C-H-L-E, Tim Sheckley's Reinventing Wires. And he explains, so do you know the fastest way to get internet delivered? It's, it's by fiber optics. OK, what happens if you go wireless with anything? These are all points that would be good for the Congressman, if you go wireless with anything, what happens immediately? You risk hacking and interception. Everyone knows this. I hear stories about people. Repeat that again. That's really important. So I hear stories about people buying a printer, a wireless printer. They plug it in, and they get hacked. Is it, do you, you know what I'm talking about? They turn it on. They don't plug it in. They, there's no cord. OK, sorry about that. But you know what? They turn it on, and they immediately get hacked within one second. OK, so I'll say it again, <laughs> that the second you go wireless, you risk interception and hacking. And this is you know, risking our, our entire national security. So we want wires. Fiber optics are wired. You can also do copper leg. We want to maintain copper legacy wires. And there are ways that I don't understand, but um, Tim Sheckley describes in reinventing wires that you can get the speed with wires. Um, it's actually much more reliable than uh, wireless delivery, and it is faster. Another major problem with wireless technologies is what happens when there's a power outage. How are you going to recharge your phone? What, how is the, the, the cell tower is going to have to go to battery backup? But um, like whenever there's a weather catastrophe, the, the mayors or the, um, the EMTs, everyone says, don't quit your landline because people don't have a way to, to reach 911 yeah. 
during a power outage. So for emergency responders we a and for ourselves, we absolutely need to maintain wired services. Um, I have a list of many other things. Um, it, it's also about democracy. And so as long as we have rules that say that our health and environment can't be considered, that's, you know, and we have no authority over where our telecom facilities go, that's a loss of democracy. And, you know, it's letting corporations rule. That, that doesn't work. Um, okay. I, the, um, what, what we're talking about is so major. And so I'm going to say, because, you know, even for those of us who've been thinking about this for decades, it's still very disorienting to know um, what, what ground are we standing on, what is really doable. And so I would also add something that hasn't been mentioned, is we need forums. Someone told me a while ago that change happens in groups of seven. So if you can start with a few neighbors and say, can we meet and talk about this like, you know, once a month or something, and maybe you would do it at your school, maybe you would do it at your workplace, maybe you would do it, you know, among family members, which would be major. You don't want to start a war, but it's already started. <laughs> and just say, okay, can we look at different aspects of this and for each of us to share what we're doing to reduce our consumption. Um, also, for the congressman, liability is an issue. Theodora has a fabulous list on ehtrust.org of what the corporations say about liability. Um, Theodora, do you want to, like, because nobody's liable for this stuff. That, oh yeah, if that's you, um, where where is if that? If you on hover your over key issues, and then there's a drop down menu, you'll see on the right side it'll have white papers of the insurance industry, electromagnetic exclusions, um, what the the lists of what the companies say in their annual reports, and you can you can click on those, and they're like four separate pages for each one because it's such a huge amount of information. The other thing um, which is major and my next book which will be out in April reports on this. The internet is the largest thing that humanity has built. It takes massive amounts of electricity. It takes massive amounts of conflict minerals and water. It emits enormous amounts of greenhouse gases. I'm going to speak some about this tomorrow night, but this is a profound energy issue. According to the semiconductor industry, by 2040, we will not have enough electricity to power electronics. Who says that? The semiconductor industry. Wow. So that's, that's, that's a national concern. Yep. And we can recognize it or we can let nature determine for us what happens. Okay, so Stephen, where's the next question at? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for this. Could you all stand up when you ask a question and project? So everyone on... She's got a microphone now. Yeah. Thank you for the Amazing information, really incredible. Okay. Um, our biggest issue, my group, is waking people up. Most of the time, if you ask people what 5G is, they have no clue. And when you try to give them information that we feel is life-saving, most of them look at you like, well, you know, like, what are we going to do about it? And, uh, the, you know, the, the big corporations are bigger than you. You're never going to succeed at this. 
So besides your letting us know uh, to call our politicians and tell them what they should vote for and, and shouldn't vote for, what other suggestions, and I know we have, you have mentioned some of them, can we tell people to wake the indifferent up? How do we wake these people up who are the great majority of the population? Well, I cannot speak about this issue, but that's what I've been doing for 48 years. People are apathetic about their health. Uh, they're dying of diseases, and they're still not willing to take any responsibility. So it's really about using the same tactics, unfortunately, that corporations do. You have to scare the shit out of them. And you have to literally, you have to literally give them examples. This expert can give you, this expert and other experts can give you, about how we know it causes cancer. This isn't a question. And you bring Stanford University into this picture. It's not you. You're the Long Island resident that's a neighbor of Mary or John. It's Stanford University saying, by the way, here's the cancer that's caused from this. And then you quote the physicist. And these two people are dedicating their entire life to help people do it. So access these people. And never, never shy away from the truth. Uh, there's so little truth today, and the powers that be know one thing from the beginning of society. You divide and conquer. And so they made the good things look odd. I was always called a health nut. What's wrong with taking responsibility for your health? I said, I am a big nut. I'm an entire orchard of nuts, by the way. I'll take that. So if somebody says you're crazy, it doesn't matter, you scare them. Not because you're vicious or immoral, because that's the way they listen. Watch the way the pharmaceutical companies do it when you're watching telly. Watch the way the ads are on the TV. And sadly, they've been trained. It's almost brainwashed into only reacting when that certain button is pressed. So we had to learn, okay, when people say to me, you know, it's a little hard to do this. Okay, well, the option is death. And here are the data, and here are the statistics, and here are the things that we know. And by the way, we don't know everything. And as she said so beautifully, this is a lot worse than we even imagined. And all they do is think about this stuff. Can you say me? Um, for me, what I've noticed is that people don't have a problem until they have a problem. So, um, and I don't believe in the mission, like the missionary position has not worked for me. So, what I do, you know, like if someone says, like I might say, well, is this a problem? I, I'll tell you, when I was at the United Nations and I presented in the General Assembly and I talked about the energy issues, I don't talk about health often because um, it hasn't worked for me to do it, even though I've got a whole book on it. But I was um, talking about energy issues and I shared this question that about three, I said about three billion people are not online yet. And we believe in universal access because for all of those people to have educational opportunities and work opportunities and even family connectedness, they should have online access as well for universal access. Okay, we're in agreement there. That means exponentially increasing consumption of energy, greenhouse gas emissions, conflict waste, um, co conflict minerals, you know, more mining, more water. Um, all of that would increase exponentially. So how do we reconcile that? I don't know anybody with an answer, but as soon as we ask the question, it's kind of sobering. Anyway, so I was at the UN and I was, you know, dealing with this, um, sharing this, and ministers from pretty much every country would come up to me and clutch my arm and say, my 10-year-old is addicted to video games. What can I do? <laughs> so there was an opening. I, I, again, I had, to, you know, I had to just be neutral and just say, I am here to listen. And then what I was hearing and what I continue to hear is that video gaming 
is an opening. Hmm. I, I wonder, is that, is that a problem? And how, and then, you know, if you can find a way to say how 5G relates to that, um, I don't know. Also, this is totally anecdotal, but maybe related. Do you all know why some teenage boys wear diapers? They won't get up. They, they don't, they don't want to leave the video game. Leave the video game. Yeah, just this morning, Anna Marie and I read at 5.30 this morning that there's many divorces now because grown men, 35, 40-year-old men, prefer video games over their family and, and children and wives. Okay, but that's an addiction. So, it's, so, so to say that, you know, again, we have to watch it. It's like people don't have control. And people are going to be scared that they're going to lose their access. And so we have to respect that. And again, yeah, you, you have to become saints and listen. <laughs> Walk on water. I think there are a lot of ways. There, there are a lot of angles, and they're all worthwhile. They really are. Sometimes I might, you know, like, I, and I think the most important thing is listening is to what is the way in with a particular person, but I also think having everyone have that information that is speaking at different angles is important. I think about when I first came into this issue and nobody was interested, I mean nobody. It was really, I, I never had experienced this before actually, um, where, where people were so uninterested in an issue. And my friend said, you know, when, when you put a new food in front of a child and you put it on the table and they've never seen it before, it's like it's an alien and they don't want to go near it, they don't want to touch it. You've got to put that food on the table every day. And, and the research shows, and I forget now how many times, if it was 17, something like that, that there's this number at which they start to go, oh yeah, that's just a thing, it's a thing I see, it's a thing I know, I think I'll try it. And I think it's like that with this information, is you put it out there all different ways, and people will come around to being interested at some point. Everyone has their different points. Maybe they get sick, maybe it's an antenna, um, maybe they get scared, but... Um, maybe it costs more money. Maybe that's going to probably be what moves this whole thing, actually. Right? That's it's going to be all about money. The property value lowering, because they've got an antenna in front of their house. But, um, you know, just remember that they will come to that place where they're like, you know, I'm going to try this. Okay, you said what? What's an electromagnetic field? You know, this could, it happens. And build, just build education on this issue. And action. Look what happened with all of you. You know, you have this TV subscription. TV used to be free. How many of you here are not subscribed to some TV service? So again, just a handful of you here. Most of you are paying $100, $150. I know people that are paying $300 a month for the privilege to radiate themselves and watch 850 channels. Now that crept up on us. And this is the same nonsense that's going to happen here. Because some of the things that they're saying that I read a lot about it are like shocking to me. I never even thought about the need for 5G being a corporate interest even more than anything else. I mean, it makes complete sense. Okay. I see a few other questions. Yes, I have that, a question oh, here. Okay. Um, and, wait, and wait, can I just ask Stephen a question? What's our timing here? Because I, I want to... 30, 30 more minutes. Okay, and so can, can we see a show of hands for the people who still have questions? Okay, there are a lot of you, so oh my goodness. Okay, I will tell you, I need to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> and so, but we want to hear as many as possible, so Let let's see what we'll we can do quickly. Okay. okay, so Verizon is in our neighborhoods, and now they're telling people that they want to swap out their old uh, modems, routers for new ones with the much higher speed. You know, a woman had mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that had a speed of 50. They would now want to bring in the 900. And of course, it seems like they're bringing in the Trojan horse with these things. And the question I have for you is, well, one is, 
We've also heard that they're putting antennas and people are or t- transmitters inside of these modems yeah. yes. that yeah. are transmitting out to the street and they're they're creating hotspots unbeknownst to the homeowner mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that yeah. that's um, putting them in yeah. harm's way. And so what people can do is they can say no to to any new modems that they're trying to to palm off on them and say no to these 5G devices that you they're going to, to be selling. You need to say something before the installation. And I can say that happened in my neighborhood, and I called my neighbor, and I said, are you aware that you're now a hotspot and, and you're more vulnerable to hacking? And I said all of those things, and this woman thinks I am certifiably crazy. So... Um, <laughs> So again, it's just, it, just you. I, the the information needs to get to people before Verizon gets to them. And this is happening all over. I can't speak for Verizon, but I'm not going to mention this other carrier that came to our neighborhood and did the same thing. And it's really important because they're putting antennas on it that you don't necessarily know how to turn off. So maybe you're someone that says, oh, I want to turn the Wi-Fi off. I'm going to hardwire. You've got your new fancy new router. You go into it. You have to go in through the computer. You turn off the Wi-Fi. Some have a hard switch. But then these other antennas are still on and radiating these hotspots for commercial use so that anyone nearby Mm -hmm. can can get online. That's that's like using your, your facility. And you're paying for it. And you're paying for it, the electricity for it. So one thing that I really recommend is when you take that time, okay, I'm going to hardwire my house, is to get your own uh, modem that you can control, that you know can you can turn off and on, although if you get a hardwired modem, it can always be on. It's always good to have them unplugged for electricity reasons as well when you're not using them. and then you're in control of what's happening. And that's... The- Theodore, do you have on EH Trust directions for getting hardwired or for getting your own modem? Well, we do. We actually have a blog post by um, Jeremy Johnson of EMNF Analysis. He did a post um, that we have on our website, which is about how to... How to get wired. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, and, uh, and, and so, and we have another uh, woman blogger um, who, who, I'm spacing on her name, but we have a, like how to hardwire your iPod, how to hardwire all of these things. But it is a little dight. It is. Yeah. It does take. You have to actually spend time with your machine. And every neighborhood is going to be different. Okay. Let's yeah. go to the next question. Who has the, the microphone? I do. Hello stand there. up. 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 Thank you so much. By the way, love your presentation. Um, Two quick things. A friend of mine shielded his house with a clay-based paint or like an adobe type of paint. I don't know if you've heard of this or um, if you recommend it or if that's a poss- you know, something that I heard about. And the other thing I really wanted to know about was you mentioned a German um, cell phone that emits no EMFs. I'd love for you to uh, elaborate on that. It's not, not the one, they probably make cell phones. I never looked into that. But the landlines that literally are not wired admit no EMF. I use Gauss meters in my house to see it. And we wouldn't know a thing until a, a year and a half ago. One of our, our friends gave us two of these beautiful phones. So if you get on the internet and put no EMF phones, you can do it. I assume they have cell phones too. I haven't taken that next step. Okay, wait, this is very important. That would not be possible because in order to operate a cell phone, any kind of wireless device, you need an antenna. And so that infrastructure will be radiating everyone in its vicinity no matter what. And so it's not possible. The phone itself is not... That's not possible. You cannot think about that phone without including... You cannot think about the phone without including its infrastructure. Well, sure. And so, and then, I like I know about landline telephones that say that they are no EMF, but I'm telling you, they emit uh, magnetic fields 
that so I am not aware of any well, well, such expl phone. Explain they to might us. emit less. Yeah. Well, explain, but they don't there's no such thing as no. Explain when you take a, a Gauss meter. Gauss would you're, be you're checking ELF. yeah, you're checking with a Gauss meter. For magnetic fields. For magnetic fields, and you're not getting any reaction. What does that mean? The, um, it means you've got a cheap meter. <laughs> well, well, wait, there's two kinds of is, meters. I doubt this is a cheap meter. This is a scientific meter. I'm just talking about what my teacher would say. He's, um, he taught at the Colorado School of Mines, and like, he doesn't believe in meters that cost less than $10,000. Well, wait, yes, I, let's, let's talk is. about the meters. <laughs> there's ELF Gauss meters, which are going to measure Magnetic extremely fields. low frequency fields, which are the radiation like from uh, electricity. And that's different than meters that are going to measure higher frequencies, radio frequencies. And I should have brought my meters with me. I have them in the hotel room. Um, but this might be one that... We, a decked phone that when you're not using it, it's not always radiating. And that's a radio which is useful, especially for harmonics. For, but it, and magnetic fields. Yeah. That's what we talked about earlier, putting, yeah. it off, putting it off a station and then hearing it. Um, this is, yeah, it, we're, go, go ahead. When you don't. Yeah. Right. But they won't sell it in the United States. Yeah. So that's where I so that's what I received. That's what I Right. Isn't that interesting? So we we have a smuggled phones. <laughs> Should we go to the next question? Let's go to the next person. Okay, thank you. Brian, you mentioned that you have uh, a certain protection that you use around your neck. That Anna Maria is very much, she endorses it. Is it available for purchase tonight? Yes, it's right here in the room over at the table. Okay, thank it's you. It's called High Pulse. And what if you get 5G up There's another thing, um, okay, do you know Huawei? Do you, do you guys know Huawei? H-U-A-W-E-I, it's the Chinese Telecom Corporation. It's been getting press lately. I don't understand a lot of it, but um, the, wife, the wife of the CEO, I think, has been arrested. Okay, oh, yes. Canada yes. has employed Huawei to install small cell sites, 5G small cell sites in Canada. And uh, Marco Rubio, and I have in my next book, I, ha I think I, I don't know if I have it on my person, but it's in the hotel. Um, there are two Congress people who have, two senators who have written to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Canada saying, for American, U.S. American security and for Canadian security, we don't Huawei, we don't want Huawei running our telecom exactly. infrastructure. Exactly. So that's another thing that you can report to um, your, con your local Congress person well, who's, the, the, who's the, the interested. Re the reason being is because these people are hacking us as we sit here today. So why, if we turned over all of our data to them, wouldn't they hack? They, they have the keys to the kingdom. Another Hi. question. Go Hi. Uh, this might help the group for 5G awareness. Congressman Swazi is a Democrat, and the Democrats are trying to get universal health care. And would he like to be re responsible for all the people that will be coming down with all these cancers? Are we going to be able to afford taking care of all these sick people and children? 
uh, which could go with anything, Monsanto, pesticides, uh, poison breast milk. I mean, all these things have to do with that. And I I worry that we won't have universal health care because they'll know they're going to be responsible for a lot of people's health, Mm -hmm. or perhaps it might get us online to only have healthy corporations that will keep us healthy so the government doesn't have to take care of our health. That's right. Can we go to another question? That. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for being here. All the great information is wonderful. Uh, I happen to have a cell antenna that was placed in my backyard on private, pro- on private property surrounded by other homes, 60 by 100 lots. And they're doing it because they're saying that uh, T-Mobile has the right, uh, that there is a private easement with Verizon that we have, but they can extend it to T-Mobile and Crown Castle. So you have to be really careful with these people. So we, uh, I live in Garden City, and Garden City is covered by um, these fields of radiation, low-lying antennas that Nobody's supposed to really know about, I guess, but they're hidden in the backyards. Mm. So uh, we, uh, the board at um, the village saw how upset the residents were, and they hired a private company for about $15,000. They were Vitatech was the name, and they came from Virginia, and they brought the very expensive unit, like you're saying, probably over $10,000, and they went to anybody's house that wanted to have it measured. So I wanted to let you know that the phones, if you buy an, an Apple iPhone, the, mo- <laughs> the most it's supposed to go is 1.6 is the cutoff for the, the radiation. So an Apple actually is that standard, 1.6. So, you know, if you look at the graph of my printout from my house, You'll see the phone, they measured the phone, and the phone is about one. You'll see the Wi-Fi is also about one. You'll see uh, there was, oh, TV broadcast is like 0.5, and then they measure the cell radiation, and you're at, some of the homes were up to six, five, six hundred on the graph. So you're going cell, 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 which you can turn on and off through the day, and then you go 24 hours a day, and you're way up high. And there's nothing you could do about it. I'm bringing that up because in New York, the Public Service Commission allows you to opt out of PSE and G smart meters, as well as National Grid smart meters. The smart meters, 777 a month for National Grid and zero for PSE and G. You just have to do it, and they put a opt-out sticker on your on your home. But anyway, the point is, is we can opt out of that. Mm. And they're letting you do that because a group of people went to New York, went to Albany and said, we're going to get sick. And they said, fine, you can opt out. Now, how is it that we can opt out of that, but we can't opt out of the magnitude of radiation 24-7 coming out of the cell antenna? That's right. Can you figure that one out? So I'm going to say... Every, every amount of radiation that you can reduce is worthwhile. And so you focus on what you can do. If you can turn your Wi-Fi off tonight, that would be worthwhile. And you can ask that you be able to opt out for that, because I think it's unacceptable. I mean, next step, right? Do what you can and then work towards these other pieces. It sounds like you're quite educated on everything going on about this, and this, this is really an important question to pose, to pose to people in your community is, hey, I can opt out of everything else. How did this happen? Let's fix this. Should we take it, one? In India, where they have, well, in some ways, the, on, on the, in the law books, they have some recommendations and they allow lower levels which is still not safe but what's happened there is there are a lot of illegal towers put up and a lot of ways that that the regulations aren't being followed but I just heard on the news um, bunches of them were taken down by people organizing advocating saying that's an illegal one that's an illegal one they need to come down and that's through raising your voices okay Okay. Airplane mode. Yeah. What are your opinions on airplane mode? 
well, airplane mode will used to turn all the antennas off. The problem is in some of the newer phones, when you put airplane mode on, so airplane mode is you're on the plane, is other antennas will come on. Well, first of all, I forgot. There's Bluetooth. There's, uh, yeah, GPS and, and tracking. There's all kinds of antennas. Yeah. At least. And the place, and, do you know the, the most increasing kind of cancer right now? Thyroid cancer. Yeah. Because the antennas are closest to the thyroid. So when you put airplane mode on. In the United States, on, thyroid is the most increasing thing. It's not necessarily, one, turning all the antennas off, depending on your phone. I've heard some of the newer phones, it doesn't turn it off. Two, you can turn it on, but then, like, you know, maybe you hand it to your kid, and they're like, oh, I want to do blah, blah, blah. And they turn that on, and that Wi-Fi antenna rises itself up. So you've got to make sure that all of them are turned off if you're going to, like, take a video or take pictures, which you can do. There's a lot of applications you can do with your phone without it being radiating or all the antennas on. But um, the best thing is to turn it completely off, to power it completely off. That's why that is so important. Completely okay. and entirely off. Okay, so I guess if you each would take a few minutes to make a final closing statement about the summation of your thoughts on wireless and 5G, and then after, if anyone has remaining questions, they can find you after and approach you directly. But in terms of your final thoughts, if you want to leave us with your um, overall conclusions about all this, um, if each of you would let us know what you want to say. Um, go ahead. <laughs> you go first. I go first. <laughs> Um, first. I'll just say my website <laughs> is electroniksilentspring.com. I think there are a few copies of my book left on the table, an electronic silent spring. And I'll just say um, I'm very humbled by the entire situation. And I. I read a couple weeks ago that humility actually gives us flexibility in any situation. So I'm kind of going for humility because it, it hasn't worked for me to know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and, and that would be true, that it's just, um, it's, it's a really unknowable, complicated situation. And every situation is unique and changing constantly. So thank you all so very much. I'm really touched by your passion and your concern. Thank you. <laughs> Why don't you tell them once again how to contact you? The, the website, Electronic Silent Spring, there's a contact form, electroniksilentspring.com. In your newsletter? Yeah, I, I have a newsletter usually about every couple months, and you can sign up for it at the website. Um, I would say that many hands make light work, and this is a situation where we all need to find what it is that we can bring to the table and, and use those skills and our love for our family and our community. But everyone has something that they can offer into this to, to make the meaningful, lasting change that we need on this issue. Um, I can't imagine anything more important than our children's future and our, our healthy future. Um, and that that should, is the driving force for me. So Environmental Health Trust, ehtrust.org. Also, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel and um, graphics that you can share on our website, social media graphics or tips that you can, we can share so people can feel like they can do something to reduce exposure at home. And Theodore, you've got materials on that table in the, in the yes. outside. 
outside, the whole, the whole. over here as well. And we also have printable materials uh, on the Environmental Health Trust website where you can download and print them yourselves or get them, get them printed. We also have a newsletter. Please sign up once a month. We don't sell anything. And um, you can uh, get the latest news as to what's happening with uh, electromagnetic fields and wireless radiation. So, and in addition to that, in your community, just like the Citizens for 5G Awareness, if you're not in this area, um, start a group so people can get educated and have conversations and begin the dialogue. Because what's happened for so long is that there's been no conversation about this. We've just been accepting all of this without thinking about all of these aspects of technology. So you need a place where there can be a dialogue and people can get educated on this. And there are a lot of videos of Dr. Deborah Davis, Dr. Melnick, Dr. Anthony Miller, all of the scientists speaking as, um, that we have on our YouTube and also on our, our website. So thank you so much. Um, it's Environmental Health Trust. And if you go to our website, ehtrust.org, up at the top, it has the YouTube, and you can click on that as well. First, I want to give a little honor and respect to these, these two women that are really fighting an uphill battle. You know, it's hard enough to tell people uh, to save their life with lifestyle, but this is even more difficult, because this is an invisible terrorist that's dynamically and dramatically changing the future of humanity. So let's give them a hand for what they're doing. Uh, next, I hope everyone here in the auditorium as well as around the world do not feel more hopeless but more hopeful. Uh, when Stephen and I sat in the car seven years ago in the dead of winter, it was about 15 degrees outside, and he said, you know, I, this wild idea, I'm going to create something, I don't know what to call it, how about if the real truth about health? Hmm. And he said, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, and I want people to know what's being suppressed, what's being hidden. And it grew out of, initially it was all about eating, and then we talked, we held our first conference right here on Long Island in New York. And then the second year I said, you know, why don't you bring other experts in? And he spends hundreds and hundreds of hours every year reading the books of these experts. And there is not another conference on the planet Earth, nor has there ever been anyone I know in all the years I've done this work that has dedicated so much time and effort uh, out of the kindness of his heart and out of his own pocketbook to bring truth to humanity. So I want to give a standing ovation to Stephen Shore. Thank you.